We're moving on to what a creative-friendly company looks like. Um, really excited to welcome back um, Sally Thornton, who spoke last year from Forche, and Jen Marr from IDEO. <laughs> it's like we're an ad for Apple. I know, this is amazing. <laughs> Would you like a Mac? <laughs> um, that was so awesome. I don't think I've ever walked on stage feeling so calm. Like, I need to have somebody go before me mm -hmm. every single time talking about meditation and, uh, and making that nice. Let's see if we can get our stuff going on up there. So, hi, I'm the Jen portion of the Jen and Sally Super Fantastic Happy Fun Time Hour, or 20 minutes, as the case may be. And I wanted to tell you a story today about how things can actually be different, because I'm working in a really, really different uh, environment. So a little more than seven years ago, I actually left advertising and joined IDEO. And for those of you who aren't familiar with IDEO, we are a design and innovation firm. So in the very simplest of terms, to like really break it down, we help organizations figure out better ways to do things. And this includes creating and communicating brands. So the substance of what I do day to day really isn't all that different than what I did in advertising, but my day-to-day -day life is dramatically different. And I remember how shocked I felt when I first started at IDEA. I remember sitting down at my desk and looking around and realizing that these people weren't in competition with one another at all, um, that I didn't need to work through the night to prove myself or race to the printer to protect my ever so precious ideas. <laughs> In fact, um, the more people who saw my ideas, the better they became. And I remember sitting there and I was thinking, like, who are these freaks? <laughs> and what I discovered at IDEO was just a very different way of working, um, one that is supportive and playful and open. And today, I want to share some of the things that we actually do to make it that way. So if it, you can think about it and say, well, that might work for me. I'm going to try that in my agency. So a little word of, of warning. Lest I make IDEO sound like some sort of touchy-feely Shangri-La, let me assure you it's not. We can be absolutely as dysfunctional and messed up as any agency <laughs> out there. But what's inspiring to me are like the little shifts from traditional agency life to IDEO that actually free me up to have a life and be more creative. And a lot of it sort of stems from this belief, and I've been hearing this again and again throughout the course of the conference, which is awesome, that you don't have to make massive shifts to see change. In fact, it's better if you start small, tweak it, see what works, you know, like kind of like prototype all of this, repeat, and then keep trying, right? In other words, you can prototype the changes that you want to see. And one of the biggest like little shifts, we keep talking about these micro actions, for me was actually just sort of a mental one when I wound up reframing my job um, in a way that helped me feel like it was okay to step away from my desk. And it's such a simple idea that I kind of thought, well, I don't know if I want to go on stage and say, like, this is my big idea. <laughs> it's your good little idea. It's my good little <laughs> idea. And I feel really silly because it wasn't even my idea. Um, and that's the idea in me. Look, it wasn't my idea. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to share it today because it's, it's such a simple thing, but I come back to it so often, and it's so helpful that I figured, you know, what the hell. Um, and it all started with something that our global creative director, Paul Bennett, said to me. And Paul said, your job is to be inspired. And I can guarantee you that working 13-hour days is not inspiring to me in the least. Um, so my job and your job, like all of our jobs in this amazing creative industry, is to fill our brains up with ideas, right? Not to drain them senseless. So if I have a choice between banging away on something that's really going nowhere, staying that extra couple of hours because just I think like I should, and then leaving to go recharge and do something with my family or my dog or just go for a run or go to a movie, whatever, it doesn't even matter, I repeat that to myself like a little personal mantra. I remind myself what my job really is. My job is to be inspired. And that permission that I give to myself lays the foundation for everything else, right? And of course, all the personal permission in the world is not going to help you if you work in an environment where everyone else is just scared to death 
to work differently. So how do you start to create the kind of environment where people feel free to live these expansive, creative lives? So nine things that help me have a life. I feel a little like David Letterman. We I love lists. Blue cards, nine things. <clears throat> All right. Number one is that we hire for culture, not just excellence. So if you are an asshole with an amazing portfolio, you are not getting into IDEO. And that sounds like lip service, because a lot of people say that. We actually really, really practice it, and we debate the people that we hire over and over and over again, not often on the merits of their work, because they have to have, a, there's a certain level you have to have before you get in. It's like, do we want to hang out with this person? And that's so huge. So for those of you who are in a position to make hiring decisions, creative directors, who, um, if you went back through the portfolios that you've reviewed, and you put that lens on, who might not make the cut? And then again, who would? <laughs> so number two, we value collaboration over competition. So sharing knowledge is actually part of your job at IDEO. And you're measured on it, right? It's not just like we say it. You're measured on it. And you move up in the company by actively helping others. So we've really we've built that into the system. And lone wolves just are not going to make it very far. Number three is that we ask each other for help. So how easy and at the same time like incredibly hard is that? Um, when I first started at IDEO, I was totally afraid to reach out to other people. And I actually got told that that was something that I needed to work on. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I was so offended by that. Like that someone was saying that I couldn't do my job well on my own. But that wasn't really what the case was at all. And eventually, I changed my behavior and started reaching out and asking for help. And I don't have to carry everything on my back all by myself. And that makes a huge difference in me actually getting out there and having a life. Number four, um, we talk about our personal commitments and expectations. And I've heard people sort of starting to talk about this during this conference too, and it's awesome. Like at the beginning of each project, we sit down, I sit down with my team, and we talk about things like office hours. When are, you gonna, when are we going to be here and work together? And when is it OK to not be here and work together? Um, days when we might have classes, family plans, all those sort of things. And it doesn't have to do with the client's schedule. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. But let's talk about our schedules first. Um, for example, I have a rule that on Mondays and Thursdays, you cannot schedule me for a meeting before 9.30 because I have a yoga class. And frankly, it's probably better to make it 10 because I'm always a little bit late. <laughs> so that's just my rule. And people know that. And it's cool because we've talked about it, right? Number five is that we talk it out publicly. So sometimes this happens live. And sometimes it happens asynchronously. So example, we have a chalkboard in the bathroom, which if you think about it is a little bit gross because everybody's grabbing it. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and we prompt things with questions like about the temperature of the company, how people feel about certain things. And people write down what they feel, and it's like the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there have been times when it gets kind of hairy, and that's completely OK. Like That's expected, and it's what we want to do is to talk it out. Number six is that we create rituals that bring people together. So we have tea time on Wednesdays, and we have homemade soup on Fridays that we all get together. Um, we have IDEO story nights. And on the surface, this might sound like just a great excuse for snacking and drinking, which it is. Um, but it's also about giving people permission to take a break and talk to one another, learn something about one another, and like, connect, right? so that we are actually working better as a team when it comes down to the work. Um, and just like stepping away from your desk, having more mind space. So when you go back to it, you're more focused. So this is a controversial one. We got rid of office, offices. Um, no one has a corner office, and that's not even the senior leadership. Nobody has a corner office. And I'd like to challenge you, for those of you who are here that are in the position to actually do something like this, if you have an office, what would happen if you turned it into a collaboration space? You're just like, screw it, I'm taking out my desk, taking everything out. It's going to be a collaboration space. I'm going to go sit on the floor with everybody else. What would that signal to the rest of your agency? And you don't have to make it that everybody does it. Maybe you just do it, and you make that signal. Number eight is that we offer classes in tangentially related crafts. So sign painting was the latest one that everybody was really into going to. 
Like, I am never going to become an artist and sign painter. Like, nobody at IDEO is really going to go out there and, and, and do sign painting professionally now because I went to New Bohemia Signs and I know how to make them. But when work actually gives you permission to leave, do something else, learn something else, it makes a huge difference. And finally, uh, we experiment on ourselves constantly, especially when it comes to health and wellness. So a really good example of this is that we all wanted to start drinking less soda and, um, and having less sugar. So we installed these spa water dispensers um, in the kitchen with just like water and ice and cut fruit. So it cost us barely a thing, but it made this huge difference. And we are all extremely well hydrated. Um, <laughs> and the point here is not like, I want everyone to go out and install a spa water dispenser and suddenly you're gonna have a life and it's gonna be great. <laughs> it doesn't really work like that. The point is that figure out what you wanna change and then figure out an experiment that would help you get there. And just try it because like what's the worst that happened? Nobody drinks the water, like whatever. It, you try something else, right? It's totally doable. So things like this obviously do not happen overnight. And if you decide that you wanna go out and change the culture of your entire agency at one time, you're gonna fail and then you're gonna come back and you're gonna be mad at me and <laughs> it's just gonna be awful. But um, if you prototype the things that you want to change and you see what works, try something small, you put it out there, it doesn't work, you change it a little bit. That doesn't work, change it a little bit. And just keep on trying those things, it can have these really far reaching ripple effects. And prototyping isn't hard, it's just trying things in low risk ways. Put it out there, learn, lather, rinse, repeat. Um, Another really important point is that it doesn't need to be physical, right? People think, well, a prototype is a physical thing. I'm going to make it and see what happens. It could be a new behavior or a rule or a new way of measuring performance. We're not going to measure on this. We're going to measure on this, right? And this, I think, this next thing is my most important point here. Do not ask for permission. I'm giving you the permission. If you need somebody to give you the permission, <laughs> just go do it. Because I'm not talking about things that you need the signature of your CFO or a major restructuring of the agency. Like, none of that needs to happen. You just want to go out there and try something. So with that, I want to hand it over to my friend here, Sally Thornton from Forche, to talk a little bit more about uh, how to make this happen. Thank you. Um, so what's great about Jen is she's got that agency background, but I'm here to share what companies are doing with these little experiments, um, because there are so many different kinds of companies. We've talked about tech companies, too where little experiments of wickedly smart people who are incredibly overworked want to have a life, and it's possible. And I care about this topic more than just a little bit. The reason is, about seven years ago, I made the transition as well. Oh, I think we have to go transition. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, uh, slide. the forward monkey. I'm the slide monkey. I made the transition from corporate to entrepreneur. Um, and, it, and my shift was, was born out of pain, unfortunately. I lost my brother in a plane crash when I was eight months pregnant. Sorry, I always do this, but breathe. Um, and it, it, it woke me up to, I love my work. And my mother said to me, you find a way, consider a new way to work your heart out at something you care about, but have a life with no regrets. And sometimes we have to make those shifts because something like this happens. But what I realized was I wasn't the only one who was going through lots of different stuff, uh, health issues from me or family, so how could we restructure work and life in new ways? So I started a company. Uh, the first one was called Flexperience, um, and now it's called Forche. And it's essentially a company to bring this to life. How do we connect independent consultants who want to have more control over their work with companies who want this on-demand resource because they want to have a life? Um, so I'm pretty obsessed with sort of bringing this future of work that I see into right now. And I want to see this blended world where companies and employees work together in a cycle of collaboration. Um, so I actually really believe in the IDEO freak mentality. I think we really get you guys. <laughs> Go for it. Like synchronized. Um, yeah, exactly. And <laughs> Apple. <laughs> um, so my job is really about giving people time back. Um, I give time to my overworked clients uh, who have probably two to three jobs in one. Um, and I give uh, time back to my consultants who were working 80 hours a week in an office and 
you know, basically left the shackles. We've heard a lot of people who've done that freelance work. So my job is about giving people time to do their best work on terms that work for their full life. But what this also means is I've been able to play at this ecosystem of work and life for seven years and sort of study it. Um, so much so that Stanford actually asked me to sit on the redesigning and redefining work group. And so Kat said, please share some of those insights about what companies are doing to bring the future of work into now. Thank you, Lev. Uh, so I'm so excited. I'm going to share three experiments because three is my favorite number. <laughs> this is awesome. I want to do like a spin. Sort of like a dance. I'm like, I hate it like that. <laughs> um, so my first uh, story is about Eric. Uh, he is a little boy with a dream who ran HR at Gap Outlet. And he was in charge of people who were do working with designers in Europe, manufacturers in Asia, and corporate headquarters in San Francisco. So you can probably imagine what kind of work schedule they had, which was always on. The people loved their job so much that they quit. And they quit because they were exhausted. And they were exhausted because they loved their job so much. So it was this, you know, rather than the virtuous cycle, it was this vicious cycle. So Eric tried a few experiments, back to the small experiments. He tried No Meetings Friday. Didn't work, but it was really popular. Um, <laughs> he tried flexible work policies, uh, which often fail because there's this ideal worker of, you know, well, if you're doing flex work and I'm not, then I'm going to be the champion and work all the time. So that didn't work. Then he tried something called ROW, which is results only work environment. And it's kind of a crazy concept, but it's really simple. It's no meetings are required. You get to choose where you work, when you work, as long as you get your work done. So you're measured ruthlessly on results. So what happened is the people who worked ruthlessly and weren't getting work done, quote, the ideal worker who had no attachments, no place to go, no uh, family, no life, they actually got exposed. They weren't making a difference to the company. And so they, they all of a sudden, you know, now he started to realize these people who are working their tails off but maybe came in late or left early or they were coaching their little league or whatever, but they were getting their stuff done, that's fine. Because now we were no longer bound by time being the measurement for your value. It was all about results. And he started small with a pilot of 100 people. It's now grown to a nine-year super successful program that uh, all of Gap Corporate now does it. The retail stores don't. It's still a little more complicated. And he started it with no budget, no CEO approval. In fact, the CEO said to him, even when he showed him the metrics of employee engagement up, retention up, business results up, the CEO said to him, I see this data, I just don't understand it, but we're still gonna do it. Because implicitly, he had grown up in a world where you just work your tail off and that's how you get to the top. And that was another interesting finding was some people who actually were trained in this row approach started crying because they had given up so much personal sacrifice as they went up in their career that they couldn't believe that now these millennials are gonna get you know, a life while they work really hard. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really a culture shift that we have to understand and recognize. And he said, he said, at first I was a little like, why are you crying? And then he realized, oh my gosh, we are humans who, when we shift the paradigm from your value is how many hours you work to your value is how do you help the team and what are the results? It's, it's actually a quite major shift, even though it was a small thing to start. I'm just going to smile every funny. time. <laughs> so that brings me to my second experiment, which is really understanding the social side of us. Because you know, we always think of ourselves probably when we go to work as intellectual first. But we're actually social, tribal, crazy humans with these awesome wired brains, as the neuroscientist just talked about. Um, and so one experiment that was really interesting was started at Juniper. And they looked at the neuroscience and said, you know, performance reviews tend to stress everybody out. They tend to actually do the opposite of our intention. Productivity goes down, people get angry, there's a lot of like going on. And they had a trust-based culture that they said and their values really mattered to them and they realized that performance reviews did the exact opposite. So they actually got rid of them. They moved it to what they call conversation day. They, they looked at the research and said, we need to rethink these old work structures and old models that allow people to be human and effective. And so 
the results were great. It's actually still a new experiment, so I wanted to throw one in that you know you don't have to have seven years of data to prove that some of these experiments have efficacy. This is a new one, but he's you know Greg Pryor, who runs HR at Juniper, basically said, you know, 66 of employees, 66 percent of employees now rate conversation day as helpful to extremely helpful, whereas before everyone pretty much didn't enjoy performance management reviews. I'm sure if I, I will ask. Raise your hand if you love that annual cycle of performance <laughs> reviews. Not a hand. OK. <laughs> and uh, Lucasfilm is doing the same thing. A lot of companies are bringing in neuroscience into people systems and experimenting with new ways that we can unlock work from these old ways of thinking about it so that people can do their best work and have a life. The last experiment I think is the coolest. Uh, it has a great name. Ethnographic intervention. Um, what this simply means is understanding what matters to people to make change that matter to the organization. Um, and this story starts with Leslie Perlow, a Harvard professor who did a small experiment at Boston Consulting Group, which is a top tier management consultant company. Um, and BCG probably suffered from what a lot of agencies suffer from, which is when you're a professional service, you work all the time. Um, and this always on culture was a problem and they were having huge retention and engagement issues. So Leslie did her ethnography and learned that they wanted something crazy. They wanted one night off a week. Dun, dun, dun. One night. It was kind of a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was a little bit surprised, but this back goes, to, goes back to the small experiments. It sometimes is just that one predictable thing where I know I'm not going to flake on my friend when we say we're going to have dinner on Thursday night, or I know I can coach my you know, child's thing or actually see my partner. Just that one day of predictability was really all they needed. And again, employee engagement went up, retention went up. But was the surprising finding here was that the clients actually said the value of the team's work who did this went up by 21%. So let's just pause on that. The team worked fewer hours throughout the week because everyone had a night off and the work quality went up. So this, we have this belief that more is better and, and it's not, <laughs> right? Better communication, um, actually looking out for, it's similar to IDEO, mm -hmm. talking about personal commitments, what do we care about as a team, how do we look out for each other, improve the quality of their work. Um, so they figured out this, this, this teamwork and, um, and I think this is another small experiment that has grown. It started I think in 2005, now it's BCG wide globally. Um, and so it started small, again, you know, not a huge budget, but, but increased over time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait. OK. Keep going. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So basically, our, our, our thesis is you can have a life. You can work really hard. They are not at odds with each other. So even though you may feel that this old model of work is, is a little bit of a shackle and that you're, you know, the harder you work, the, the better you look, Consider that these small experiments can unlock yourself, unlock your team, increase productivity, increase creativity, mm -hmm. and allow you to have the life you want with no regrets. So we want to build on Cindy's challenge for what these micro actions are that each of you can take. Um, and so we've actually built time into our session for you to do this. So we are action oriented. Yes, we are. Uh, we would like you to write down one change that you will make or consider making um, then it may be about a behavior, a rule, a new way to think about performance. Think about one change that you will consider making, a small experiment that you will prototype like IDEO and, and, uh, and share maybe. Would anyone be willing to share? Ah! Please. <laughs> Look at that. It pays so to sit next to Catherine. My micro action is going to be I'm not going to respond to the email that I just got from a client who wants me to do some work while I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody else? It's hard to see. Hey, over and over there. The front row is always so I know. participatory. The eager folks. Mm -hmm. 
I absolutely love the idea of um, talking about personal commitments ahead of client commitments. I think that's really brilliant and something that I want to take back to Doug and Shannon for sure. That's awesome. Fantastic. We've got another one back there. Oh, no, she's describing like, doesn't have to be like, a, you don't have to even think about a little thing. You could just be like, you know what? On Tuesdays, I'm always going to have lunch. I'm going to schedule it into my day. Like, whatever it is. It could be anything. Um, I think a yeah. big one that women do is apologize a lot. And I think specifically for me, apologizing for vacation time or leaving when I need to leave, uh, not saying sorry all the time. Nice. So, Jen Shaw. Hi, hi. Uh, a while back, I had started this program. I didn't ask for permission. It wasn't sponsored by Ogilvy, but it was DIY Wines Day, <laughs> where we would, we would vote on what uh, didn't have to be a craft or whatever, but we would do it, and we would stop. We would not have meetings at 4 o'clock. We only had it once, <laughs> so my micro action is to actually reinstate that, and we did have both men and women come to it, and it was quite fun. Awesome. Yeah, and you know, that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, as much as we are focused on enabling women leaders to rise uh, to whatever position they want, it often is an ecosystem change. If we try and focus on one subgroup, um, it often fails, and that's one of the reasons that Fleck work Flex works policies have often failed because there's a have and a have not group. So the, the experiments that I'm seeing in the future of work are about changing the system work for everyone. It really works because there's no backlash effect. And even in the BCG experiment, they had some, I will say, young 20-year-old men who didn't want to do this one night off. They were like, this is dumb. <laughs> And they had to literally say, you may not check voicemail, you will not check email, or you will be in trouble because they wanted to be that ideal worker. And you really have to have the whole team kind of behind something. That's the stuff mm -hmm. that we're seeing that have, has efficacy is when the team is behind something. If you're trying to help a subgroup, it's much more challenging. So I think it's really great that whatever you do as you focus on your experiment is consider the whole. Absolutely. And that's a dirty little secret, right? Is that like working all the time doesn't make you more creative. It makes you less creative. You actually, you need that time. To, like, Seeing a movie is not something that is outside of your job. Like it, it's important. It should for be us deductible. To... <laughs> Actually, it is. If you've got a good accountant, all that entertainment budget. <laughs> it's really important to be plugged into what the hell's going on out there in the world, and we're fooling ourselves if we think that we can find out by staying at our office. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to get out there and do stuff. Um, I see that we've got 26 seconds left. Awesome. So with that, I, um, I want to ask if there's anybody in the audience who is sitting there and be like, I want brutal honesty. Who's sitting there saying, like, yeah, that's great, but it's not going to work at my agency for reasons X, Y, and Z? Anyone? OK, so I love all you guys. Love it's so positive. I know. So I actually want to take a page out of Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In book. And what she's done so well, I think, is had people stand up for themselves. Because really, you are the heroes. I see some men and heroines that make the change happen. So I would like everyone to stand up if you are considering making one change in your work life to have a life. All right, so look around the room. If we all made a small shift in how we think about work and life, it would make a massive difference. It's like a ton of people. You make it happen. Woo! <laughs> I know, there's people running around the stage. You make it happen. You and you and you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.